It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've been coming here for any length of time, you know that Word of Truth Baptist Church, we, we teach the whole Bible. We believe in the whole Bible. We believe that the whole Bible is profitable. We believe that... We're not just bound to only instruction from the New Testament. We, we preach from the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a lot of things that we learn from both. There's, there's laws that are profitable for us to follow. The Bible says you know, in Romans chapter 6, What shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course we don't want to sin. And how do we figure out what sin is? Well, we've got to go back to the law. We have to go back to what God said. This is what you do and this is what you don't do. And that's how we know whether or not we're sinning. And we go back to the law we see in, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, we see in Leviticus, we see these laws that God has laid forth. Now we know, I'm not going to go into this in much detail, we know that some things have changed with Jesus Christ. We know that we're no longer offering up sacrifices, we're not butchering lambs and putting them up on the altar. Okay, all of that stuff is clearly laid out in the New Testament, the stuff that has been done away. And it's, the only reason it's been done away is because it's been fulfilled in Christ. When Christ came the first time, he fulfilled many aspects of that law. But the whole law hasn't been fulfilled. That's why Jesus himself said, you know, one jot or one tittle shall not fail from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, all has not been fulfilled yet, but many things have. The, the prophecy of the, the lamb to be slain for, for the world, yeah, that has been fulfilled, which is why we don't continue to offer lambs unto God because Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. And, and there's many other things like that. The Bible teaches that it's, you know, that the, it's washings and carnal ordinances and things like that that have been done away. The Levitical priesthood type of laws. The things regarding the tabernacle and the service of the Levites since the priesthood changed. That has also changed. But you know what's not changed? is just God's laws. What, what some, many people call moral laws or... Um, just things that, that are, had nothing to do with the Levitical priesthood. They're just, just, this is the way things are. These things is, are, are, you know, we shouldn't um, just skip over or think that they're outdated or we don't need to worry about those things these days. We do. We started off in Deuteronomy 22. There's a lot of, a lot of material covered there. We're only going to be focusing on one verse of this whole chapter. And that's verse number five. Verse number five says, The woman shall not wear... That which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, a lot of people will scoff and say, oh, you think God cares about what I wear? Do you think God really cares about that? Well, if he didn't, then this wouldn't be in the Bible. Now, I'm not going to say he cares about every single little detail about everything that you put on, like, like whether or not I'm wearing black socks or white socks or something like that. Okay, that's not defined in Scripture. But there are things that are defined in Scripture, and this is one of them. And this is one we need to make sure, make sure that we are taking heed to because it actually uses a very strong word. It says it's abomination. The word abomination means it's something that's hated by God. It's something that God really despises and he hates. He hates to see his creation. God created male and female. He created man and woman. He created Adam first out of the dust of the ground. He created Eve out of one of his ribs to be a partner, to be a help meet for Adam. And he created men and women differently. Very differently. And this is something that I know I've, I preach on kind of regularly because they need to fight this culture that's trying to, to cram everyone into this androgynous type of person and using these, you know, gender neutral uh, terminology and people want to be men wanting to be women and women want to be men and people wanting to just be non-gender, non, you know, all these stupid terms. They're being thrown out there that, that's just causing confusion instead of something that's just so basic and simple. You're either a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. It's very simple to understand the difference between the two. God has made us physically very different, physically different, emotionally different, and in so many different aspects different from one another, yet complementary to one another. 
which is why he said that the man shall leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Because God's design is for a, one man and one woman to join together in union in marriage. And his plan works. The way that he designed this anatomically works. <laughs> a man and a woman fit together. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman. A man and a woman fit together. Now, there are so many differences between men and women. And, and you get this throughout Scripture. I'm not going to go too far into this point. But it would only make sense that since there are so many differences that God would want men and women to dress different just to show the distinction. Hey, I'm a man or I'm a woman. The first thing I want to make you understand, though, or just help you understand, if you didn't know this already, is that God doesn't change. I've mentioned the fulfillment of part of his law as a difference between Old Testament and New Testament and the way that we practice, the way that we serve the Lord, the way that we worship, or the way that we, you know, that we conduct ourselves. In, in regards to service to the Lord. There have been a few changes that way, but it's really just because it's a matter of fulfillment. But God does not change. God himself, who God is, what God feels, what he thinks about things, he, he doesn't change. You know, if God hated something in the past, if God called homosexuality an abomination in the past, guess what? He feels the same way about it today. If God felt that a, a woman wearing that which pertaineth unto a man or a man putting on a woman's garment is an abomination in the Old Testament, he still feels the same way about it today. God doesn't change about those things. He doesn't change. Like, we, we live in a world of all kinds of change where the world just teaches you, you know, cultures change. What people believe about different things change. But you know what? God does not change. That's why the Bible is eternal. It's timeless. You have people today who want to tell you, oh, yeah, you know, even within our own country, within the past few hundred years, a few hundred years ago, people would be like, oh, yeah, the Bible, that's the word of God. We're going to stick by that. You know, the culture was much more uh, enriched by the Bible and would, would follow these principles. And we're going into a sermon tonight about... Um, you know, false witnesses and punishments and stuff like that. You go back and look at the laws of like the colonies and the punishments. It was really pretty closely aligned with what the scripture dictates. It was very close. I mean, they had the death penalty for, for, for rapists and kidnappers and adulterers, which are all the things that the Bible has a death penalty for. People today look think about that and you're just like, that's insane. What do you mean a death penalty for those things? But well, that's what God's judgment is. That's what God's word says. And that's the way it was in this country. But you can see how, how easily things can change to go to the point to where people think you're insane or nuts to have that type of a punishment when just a few hundred years ago, it was way different. Because cultures change. The world changes changes. God's word does not change. God does not change. The Bible says in Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. God doesn't change. God's attitude doesn't change. Morals should not be changing with the culture. The culture should not dictate what's right and what's wrong. This book dictates what's right and what's wrong. God's laws are also not bound by culture. And it's important to get this understanding out of the way first because we're dealing with something like clothing. What happens with clothing? It's fashion. What happens with fashion? It changes all the time. All the time. I mean, even, even within my own lifespan, I'm 41 years old, how many, how many fashion changes have there been? It's like each decade there's a new fashion change, right? Right? People are laughing. I, I was going through some old pictures, you know, in the, in the 80s, I had the mullet, right, with the, the, the longer hair in the back and the spiked hair on top. And you could look at the, you know, the parachute pants and the, the things that were going on in the 80s that were cool and popular going into the 90s. And you got the, you know, whatever, all these different looks that are put out there. And most of the, the, the fashion changes put out there by the, the media anyways, not the media, but like the Hollywood and and rock stars and stuff like that, they've influenced culture so much. Like the grunge look. I mean, think about how many, how many different 
uh, or emo, right? That was another one that came out. Or, you know, all, all these different gothic looks, they all kind of originate with people who have influence over the culture, like the musicians or like the, the movie stars. And, and that changes over time. And with something that changes so frequently, we cannot let our culture dictate what's right and wrong or what the standard is going to be as far as what men and women should be wearing because it's going to keep changing. Now, here's a very simple, when we're talking about specifically this verse, because what's it talking about? It's talking about cross-dressing, right? When a woman puts on something that's a man's clothing or when a man puts on something that's women's clothing, you're cross-dressing. Now, this used to not be very difficult to understand. There's a word for it. It's, you know, it's a transvestite. At least that's the word that I know. When there's a tranny or transvestite that people would say, oh, man, oh, this, oh look at that, there's a tranny over there. What are they talking about? Usually what that is referring to is like a guy dressed up like a girl. That's kind of more common that, that if someone were to call someone out as being a tranny or transvestite, they're usually talking about a man that's like dressed in a dress or something. Now, would anybody think that it's not cross-dressing if a man were to put on a dress, like a wedding dress or whatever? Even in our culture today, people can look at that still and say, yeah, that's cross-dressing. Does it really matter what type of a dress it is? Or are we still going to say, that's what women wear? Thankfully, thankfully we still are in a culture where people can get that and understand that because it's going to make my point a little bit easier to make. What if we lived in a culture, though, what if fashion designers started making dresses for men? Which I think they might st are already starting to do. I don't know for sure. I've seen things like that before. What if they start doing that? Maybe they make a camo dress, right? It's a, you know, a real manly dress. What if the Hollywood stars all start wearing them? Would it then become acceptable for men to wear dresses? In our culture, it may. We, uh, we're probably headed that way. But I bring this up to, to, to get you to think and understand, hey, look, no, there is something, no, when, the, when the Bible says, when God's word says, the woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. God has an idea of what belongs on a man and what belongs on a woman in order to even make this type of a statement. Since God doesn't change, I can guarantee you God's not saying, oh, well, that was wrong a hundred years ago, but now it's just fine. Now something else is wrong, you know, and just changing with the whole culture of what's right and what's wrong. Do you really think God's law and something that he hates is designed to just be real fluid and changing just all throughout history? Because I don't think that it is. What, if that were the case, then what would happen if you had a society or a culture where it's like this Star Trek type of generation where everyone's just wearing like a jumpsuit? Everyone's just wearing this one-piece garment. You say, well, there is neither men nor women's clothing. It's all just one thing. Well, is that a man's clothing? Is it a woman's clothing? I don't know. It's all just the same thing. That, then does this verse just no longer apply at all? It's just, just completely making... God's word of none effect. That's actually the, the mentality that the Pharisees had. That's what they did. The Bible says in Matthew 15, 5, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother, ye shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. If our culture comes up with some tradition of what men and women should be wearing as far as just, well, it's just an and androgynous one piece outfit. What they're doing is then trying to make God's law of none effect. But see, God's going to hate that too. 
because there are garments that are associated with women and there's garments that are associated with men and they have been all throughout history. It's never been extremely difficult to understand, but what happens is when we live in a society or a culture that's been pushing one way for a super long period of time, and maybe people have been ignorant about this, or, or you, know, you grow up just living a certain way, and you haven't even heard this explained, it might be difficult to really connect all the dots and put it together. Okay, but it shouldn't be that hard. It's so simple that it's still used to differentiate men and women's bathrooms. If you were to go to the bathroom anywhere pretty much in the world and you want to know which bathroom should I use, all you have to do is look at the picture. And what are you going to see on the picture? You're going to see one room that has a, a little stick figure, right? A little round head and little like, kind of round arms and round legs, but what are you going to see? Kind of like a triangle near the bottom, right? And what are you going to see on the other one? You're going to see another little stick figure, a circle head, rounded arms, and you're going to see both legs. Right? I mean, am I wrong? Is that not what you see when you go, when you go to just use a restroom? You're visually differentiating men and women by what they're wearing. That's how you decide which restroom to use. It's common sense, yet in today's world, what I'm going to be preaching on, because I haven't even gotten that specific yet, is just people get nuts over this. And I'm going to get all kinds of hate over this because I'm going to show you from the Bible that women specifically should not be wearing pants. There, I said it. That's exactly what I'm going to be preaching on. Just as much as men should not be wearing dresses. But see, there's not as much of a problem today with, with men wearing dresses. It's, not, it's, it's, not, it's still not socially acceptable. But beware, because it probably will be. As this country just continues to get more and more wicked and just away from Scripture. Because what's stopping it? And let me give you a little bit of history, too, about women wearing pants. I don't have this written. Now, I preached on this before. You know that most of the fashion designers anyways in this world are sodomites? But there was specifically one sodomite that just died and went to hell about five years ago. I think it was five years ago, somewhere around there. He was known in his, like, in their remembrance of him. It says he was the one that's known for putting women in pants. But he was known for that. Why? Because prior to that guy kind of pushing this fashion and getting it into Hollywood and getting it in front of everybody's eyes, women didn't wear pants. They wore skirts and dresses. But this guy, he's just propped up as being, this is the guy that put women in pants. And it's a sodomite, a God hater. Just, I mean, just let that sink in. But see, we can even get, without using just common sense, God still gives us pretty good indication on what men should be wearing. And specifically, he gives us everything. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 28. And we're also going to look at Leviticus 16. Because there are references to men and what they wear in the Bible and what it calls it. Exodus 28, we're going to look at verse number 42. And this is, this is talking about priests, but the priests were always men. The priesthood was for the men, not for women. Women didn't participate in the priesthood. It was always men. And there were garments that were outlined. Now, they had bonnets or, you know, we, we think of bonnets as, you know, maybe something like a woman's hat, but the word bonnet literally just means it's a hat. There were other things, other garments that they were they were, you know, that God said that they need to wear in order to do service unto the Lord that were going to be acceptable by God for them to wear. So it's a pretty good place to look at when God's saying, this is what I want the men to wear 
to then understand, well, this must be a good man's garment. If God's the one saying, this is what I want him to wear. Exodus 28, verse number 42, the Bible says, and thou shalt make them linen. Now the word there, it says breeches, but what that is, it's just an older spelling, older form of the word breeches. So if you ever heard the word breeches, familiar with that word? And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins, even unto the thighs they shall reach. So he's saying, now we know what breeches are, because that's the word being used here. Breeches are pants. And he says here, well, the, the pants at least need to go from the loins, which is you know, around your waist area, and cover your thighs. And your thigh ends at your knee. Right? Your thigh goes all the way up and down this area. So they need to cover from here to here. So, I mean, we might call them shorts today, but basically they're pants. It's, it's a material that goes, it's, you know, I got pant legs, goes down there, they're breeches. That's what God designed for his priest. Leviticus 16, I you, hope you got a finger in there too. Leviticus 16, verse number 4, basically says the same thing. It's another reference to the britches. Uh, I'll just read it. Leviticus 16, 4 says, He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. So again, another description of... Um, of breeches being worn by men. Now, think about it. You say, well, what is it? Why is it that breeches that make it men's garment? What about the, um, you know, we also said a coat. Like, is a coat a man's garment? I don't think a coat is necessarily a man's garment. There's, there's a lot of things that you could, you could look at. Like, our, for example, let's start with socks. Are socks particularly men's or women's garments? No. It's very functional. Is... A shirt, necessarily a, woman, a man's or woman's garment? No. But there has to be something that differentiates a man from a woman, especially when it comes to their clothing. Now, there are things that I think we should stay away from, but I don't, when it's talking about a man's, because it says it uses the word garment in the law, it's, 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 it's a, so it's an article of clothing. It's not talking, I don't think it's talking about the color, right? It's not just saying, oh, well, it's pink or it's blue, right? Because there, there are cultures where, like uh, Mexican or Hispanic cultures will use a lot of lighter pastel type colors and men will wear, I've seen men wearing, you know, like, like lighter orange or even pink clothing, but it, like in their culture, it's, it's, you know, man or woman. I, I, I can't find anything in scripture that says anything about color being the distinguishing factor. Now, we ought to understand the spirit of the law. So I think the spirit of the law is that God's putting a difference between men and women. Just like you could, you could find the same spirit in 1 Corinthians 11 when it talks about the length of your hair. The Bible says that doth not nature itself teach you that, that if a man have long hair, it's a shame. But that, that, hair, is given, that, that uh, the hair is given a woman for her glory. I mean, that's, that's what his word says. So you start seeing these differences, and I think the spirit of God's law is he's saying, I want there to be differences. I want you to be able to tell and distinguish between a man and a woman. I made them different. They have different roles, different jobs, different functions, and, and they are different from each other. He values them both equally. Men and women are valued the same. God loves women. He loves men. He made them both. But their roles are different. Their, their function is different. And I covered this last week on a Mother's Day sermon, but you know, when, when we're talking about women's job and raising children and stuff, that's a very important job. It's a very valuable job. It's, it's extremely important. It's not something that should be demeaned or looked down upon. Just because a man is going out and working hard and earning money to support the family doesn't make that better than the woman's job of keeping things running at home and, and raising children and stuff. They're just very different from one another. You can't say that one's better than the other. Just as much as any of the, the, the tools that you use or instruments that you have, they all perform different jobs. One's not better than another. They're just different. And God wants there to be a difference. So we ought to make sure that when we are 
even getting dressed, that we're not abominable unto God, that he's not hating the way that we look because we're making ourselves look too much like the other gender. Now, I've heard this argument before, and I'm going to address it. So what about when the Bible mentions men with skirts? What about that? So in our modern vernacular, when you hear the word skirt, what you typically think of is a woman wearing a shorter dress, right? Going from the waist just down to her knees-ish area, whatever. I mean, now they're, they're going way up smaller, but just kind of this, this round little thing, right? That's what we typically think of for the word skirt. But I'm going to actually give you the definition just, just that I pulled offline. Because it's actually not that hard. The word skirt do, isn't just solely about that type of piece of garment. That's actually not even the primary definition. Skirt just means the lower part of like a garment or something. Even, even think about this. Think about the word the outskirts of town. What are you talking about? The, the outer region in an area. It's, it's the, the frill or that, that, that section that, that's, that's on the outer elements. Those are outskirts. So that word skirt literally means it's just the lower portion. So here's the definition, though. Just I'll just give you this from dictionary.com. Number one is the part of a gown, dress, slip, or coat. Right? Remember we saw the priests were dressed with coats. Any of those things that extends downward from the waist. So I'm wearing a coat right now. Here's the skirt of my coat. Now, would you say Pastor Burzins is wearing a skirt? No. But what if I were to say, I'm going to cover you with my skirt? What if, my, what if one of my children came up here and they come up to about my waist? So I'm going to cover them with my skirt. I could, I could put this around them and cover them. But that doesn't mean I'm wearing a woman's coat. Would anyone say I'm wearing women's clothes today? Good, I hope not. <laughs> that would be really weird. No. So the word skirt literally just means the lower part. And, and this becomes obvious that this is the biblical use of the word. I'm going to give you some of the examples too because it, it's, what it is is people just not wanting to accept the Bible just for what it teaches and they're trying to find some loophole or some, oh yeah, you, you say that that's women's clothes. What about these men wearing skirts in the Bible? They weren't wearing skirts the way that you're talking about them. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Turn, to return if you would to 1 Samuel 24 because there's a few verses in there. But 1 Samuel 15, verse number 27, the Bible says, And as Samuel turned about to go away, this is talking about with him and King Saul, King, Samuel was turning away from Saul. So then, and as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. The skirt of his mantle. Mantle. What's his mantle? It's like his, his shirt. It's an upper covering for your body. And he laid hold on the skirt of that, on the end of that, and he tore off part of it. And ju just the fact that it says skirt of his mantle, it's referring to a different article of clothing in just the particular section of it, the skirt of the mantle. 1 Samuel 24, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. So what was Saul wearing? A robe. What did David do? He cut off the skirt of the robe. He cut off a little piece from the bottom of his robe. Verse number five, And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So what people want to do is look at verse number five and see, yeah, see, Saul was wearing a skirt. He cut off the, the Saul's skirt. No, he cut off the skirt of his robe, the lower portion of his robe. And then in verse number 11, the Bible says, Moreover, my father, see, yea, see, the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know that, you know, it's obvious what the Bible is using that word skirt as in Scripture. It's talking about a lower portion. So don't let that bother you when people want to say, oh, well, if, if you think that, you know, and this is where people might want to justify wearing kilts. Because we, we had a Scottish culture 
that thinks it's just fine for men to be wearing what we know as skirts. And I think that's wrong. Amen. I think that's an abomination. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care if they're wearing bag bagpipes and dressed up in a certain way and it's, oh, this is our heritage. They're wearing skirts. God doesn't think that's okay. I'll tell you what else I don't think is okay. On October 31st, for men to just think it's funny to go up and get dressed in a dress and go out and go to some party because you think, ha, 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 I'm going to dress as a woman. God hates that. Amen. He thinks that's an abomin abomination. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. But see, when we read the Bible, we have, to have, we have to get our hearts right. We have to be able to look at Scripture and say, how can I be pleasing in the sight of the Lord and not hated in the sight of the Lord? And when you read a, a verse like that, I mean, just apply it to yourself. I don't, look, we don't have rules in this church, especially when it comes to just, like, dress. You are, you are welcome, you know, to, to wear what, what you'd like to wear, but I'm going to preach what the Bible says, and, I, and hopefully you love God's word enough to say, at least question, is, is what I'm putting on, is that right? Is this, is this what God would have me to wear, or is it not? And God's word needs to be applied to the day that we live in. Now, the Bible does not specifically mention garments worn by women like it does with the priests. But it does mention this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So there's a few things I want to cover in this passage, but the first thing I just want to point out is the reason why we kept going. The first part talks about that we start reading in verse number nine, talks about their apparel, what you wear. And then it goes straight from what women should be wearing. Or, you know, and again, it's not just specifically about your garments, but um, it goes right into this difference between men and women about women being silent, women learning and being in subjection and not usurping authority from the man. It goes straight into this one of these divisions that God has created between men and women. Straight from talking about their apparel to I've made a difference. Women are in subjection to men, and that you're not supposed to usurp authority over the man. But let's look at, at what the Bible says that women should, should adorn themselves with. So the Bible says that the women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now that word modest is very important, because that's what's describing the type of clothing that women should be wearing. What, what is it to be modest? So people have a lot of different definitions. Ultimately, modesty would be not drawing attention to yourself in probably one of the most basic terms. It's not about me. It's about someone. It's, it's, it's a very humble type of, a, of, of apparel. Modest is, is uh, if you're a man of modest means, right? You don't have very much. You're not, you're not lifted up. So Modest apparel is, uh, and that's why he mentions, with Shane Fraser's right, not with broided hair, gold, pearls, costly array. See, the first thing that, that, that I think most people think of, I know I think of when you hear just modest clothing, the first thing you think of is the low-cut tops, right, or the, the really short skirts and dresses and things where that's just real tight, form-fitting, where it's not leaving anything to imagination, and you're pretty much just showing off your body of course, that is immodest. That is not modest to be putting your body out on display like that. But why is it not modest? Because it's drawing attention to you. Because when women wear the low-cut tops, you know what it does? It draws eyes to that. 
It does. You say, oh, well, you know, people today want to say, oh, well, it shouldn't be like that. Oh, well, you know what? That's the way it is. And if you're going to obey the Bible, the Bible says that you should dress modestly, not drawing that attention to yourself. The same way it says, you know, don't be dressing up real fancy and flashy, right? Just Because maybe you can have a nice, you know, top going way up here and, and you can be dressed down here, but, but you're, you're wearing all these sequins and flashy stuff and glitter and, and, and everything else just done up to make everybody look at you. And that's not modest either. Both things need to be considered. How much you're revealing of yourself, of your own flesh, your own body, as well as what you're putting on to make people look at you. But see, here's where, these are, these are the principles. These are the basics. The rest is up to you. You've got freedom. You've got liberty to wear, you know, basically what you want to wear. God's just saying, look, if you're a man, just wear men's clothing. And if you're a woman, wear woman's clothing. If you're a woman, just be modest. You can decide what colors you want to wear and exactly how the thing's tailored or whatever. You know, there's a lot of freedom you have, but go off of these principles. Go off of the principles that God made men and women different. And think about, think about it. I, I never really finished my point with men, in, with men in dresses. Of course, that seems obvious. But I just want to challenge you if you think that women wearing pants is just fine, then what is a man's garment? What, is it, what could it possibly be that women are not supposed to wear? Just, just, what is it? If it's silly to think of men's dresses, like a camo dress, like I mentioned before, then wouldn't it be just as silly to say that there's women's pants? But today people are going to tell you or tell me, people tell me this, oh no, that just means, you know, when you go to the store, you just shop in the, in the men's section, not the women's section. How much difference is there really between men's pants and women's pants? The way it fits your body? It's the same garment. It's the same piece of clothing. But you, you have to ask yourself that question, then what, what is it? As a woman, what should I not be wearing? What is it that pertains to a man that, where you could just say, that's a man's clothing? What else could it be? Because It's not going to be the socks. It's not going to be the undergarments because that's not even an important. You know, it's, it's what people see on the outside. That's what is going to matter. God does care about the way that we dress. Now, it isn't something that's just, you know, over and over and over again, God's just talking about what you wear. It's actually only in a couple of verses where it's referring to how we're dressed. So I don't just preach on this all the time, but you know what's in the Bible? I'm going to preach on it. And it's actually more of a problem today than it has been in other eras because we've got people cross-dressing and I think oftentimes people don't even realize it. And one of the reasons this church exists is for, it exists for people like me and for people like you that... We love God. We love God's word. And hey, if I'm, if I'm doing something wrong, if I'm in sin, I want to know about it. I don't want to just be kept in the dark over it and just be abominable in the sight of God every day. I'd rather just know about it. It, it may sting a little bit. It may hurt a little bit to, to hear it. But I'd rather get right than just keep continuing going off and just doing the same old thing that God is mad at. Let me know where I'm wrong. And we need to have that type of a heart with God just looking at his words. Say, God, I know I'm not perfect, so please help me to try to find more of my flaws. That's the attitude we need to have. That's a good attitude that's going to keep you in church and keep you going strong and just get you on that right path. You get blessed by God by having that attitude, being willing to change and just willing to accept what God's word says. And I don't preach these things because I hate women. I don't preach these things because I hate anyone individually. I preach these things because I care about you. That's why. I mean, that's my motivation. You know, sometimes I yell and rant and scream and say it's wicked and everything else, but it's for your benefit. It's not, it's not because like, oh, I can't believe so-and-so is wearing it. You know, that's, that's not the point. The point is I'm here to try to help. And 
as someone who's read the Bible many, many times and I've seen these things, I'm trying to share that with you and just share this understanding. You do what you want with it. The way you dress, the, though, is important. It says something about you. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Proverbs 7.10 says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. What do you wear is an indicator of who you are. Now, that verse I just quoted you, Proverbs 7.10, it didn't say that the woman was necessarily an harlot, but it said that she was dressed with the attire of an harlot. So what that means is that there, are, there is a certain way that a harlot or a hooker or a prostitute dresses. There's a way that they look. And it's known by pretty much everybody. If I just say, imagine what a prostitute would look like in your mind, we'd all probably come up with something pretty similar. Probably not wearing very much clothing at all. Probably being pretty, pretty flashy and exposed. Why? Because she's trying to to gain her, her means of income and just seduce men to, to paying her to, to lay with her. Which is just extremely wicked. But if that's the way a harlot looks, is that the way that you want to look? And this is just one example. There's, there's plenty of other examples you can use. I mean... It's not that hard. What, what, is a, what does a thug or a gangster look like? What do you think that's the way that you as a Christian should look like? And, and you just fill in, just, just think about different, different types of people and what they're going to look like. You say, oh, that's stereotypical. Oh, don't judge me. Well, look, the stereotypes are usually there for a reason anyways. Now, what I'm going to show you here is that it still is, what, what is most important is what's on the inside. Absolutely, that is more important than what's on the outside. But what I want, what I'm teaching this morning is that the outside still does matter. What Jesus said was, you know, about the outside of the platter. He says, well, cleanse that first which is inside that the outside may also be clean." So he says, first, take care of the heart. First, take care of the inside. Yes, that is most important. Let's get that settled first. Let's get our heart right with God. Let's get that cleansed. Let's get that right. And then we can start moving outward and focusing on the outward stuff. But see, this outward stuff should be very easy. The stuff in the heart is a lot harder, right? They can be a lot more difficult to change. The outward stuff should be no problem because ultimately, does it really matter? Anyway, to you, like, like, would you really want to cling to, like, as, as a man, like, do you really want to cling to having, being able to wear that dress or as a woman being able to wear those pants or as a man, you know, I really want to just be able to have my hair just really long. Like, what, does it really matter? Does it really matter to you? I mean, if it does, you, then you need to focus on the heart. I don't know about you, but it, but it doesn't matter to me. If God's telling me to do, this is the way he wants me to be, then in my heart, that's what I want to do. Now, we still have the sinful flesh. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but in my heart, I'm going to say, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, I want to change. Yeah, I want to be what you want me to be, God. As opposed to, I want to be what I want to be, and I don't want God telling me what to do. That's a heart problem. But this, this last passage in James chapter 2 will kind of help to, to illustrate this point a little bit. When it comes to receiving people at church, especially, we shouldn't be partial to how well-dressed they are or if they line up to our standards of what we believe. Because I'm teaching standards. I believe that, that you know, men wearing dresses and women wearing pants are, is, is cross-dressing. And that, that's, not, that's not what we should be wearing. But you know what? When someone comes into church, I'm going to greet them. I'm going to give them a nice place to sit regardless of that. Now, <laughs> let me put it, if a man comes in wearing a dress, I'm not necessarily going to say that they're welcome because especially in our society, I mean, with women wearing pants, that's something that's been culturally accepted and that doesn't mean that they're just going to be some perverted weirdo. I'm not saying that it's not an abomination, but if a guy comes in here wearing a dress, 
they're not going to be welcome here wearing a dress. I will say that much. I will make that stand. And it's not because, and it's because men that do that in our culture are perverts. That's the bottom line. They would have to, if they were just seriously confused somehow, I don't know how, or they came from somewhere where like men wore dresses, then, then I would have a talk with them. But that would just be weird. But look at James chapter 2, because this is talking about someone who comes in who's kind of rich and has a lot of money and someone who's poor that comes in, right? James chapter 2, verse number 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and gay just means happy or bright, uh, and then say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. So he's saying, you know, don't, just because someone comes in looking real nice and fancy, and, oh, it looks like they have a lot of money, they're not going to get any preferential treatment over someone that comes in that is obviously poor and doesn't have a lot of means. And they're not maybe dressed as fancy as the person who's got a lot of money. And he's actually rebuking them saying, look, it go, it can, the, the chapter continues on to saying, don't rich man oppress you? Like, like, why would you even bother to give more regard to the person with more money? Isn't, isn't that usually the person who's going to be afflicting you and oppressing you anyways? And the poor, God's chosen, they're rich in faith, and you know, spiritually speaking, the poor is probably going to be more esteemed by God anyways. And that's why he's saying, don't, don't become this respecter of persons where you're allowing the, the just the way they appear financially to, to influence how you treat them, especially in church. So we get someone coming in and, and they're you know, down on their luck or whatever, and maybe their clothes are a little tattered or maybe, the, you know, what a, I'm not going to be like, oh, you, you sit in that back corner over there. I mean, that'd be wicked. That would be wicked. You invite them in just like anyone else. Or just because someone comes in and they're, you know, oh, it's obvious, this, you know, President Trump comes in. Oh, let's give you the, here, you could sit right here. This is, this is your seat, right? You can, and, and I could just talk to you. No, no. You could sit down there with everybody else and learn from the Word of God. Like, not that that's going to happen, but, you know, we're not going to have respect of persons here because, because God doesn't. So, you know, this topic ruffles feathers. I get it. You know, the goal isn't to upset anybody when we preach this type of stuff. I'm not out trying to make enemies. But you know what I am trying to do? I'm trying to just stay uh, loyal to God's word and committed to God's word. And this is, this is the way I see it. I, I don't, I, it's kind of hard to argue. I've, I've seen and heard a lot of arguments to the contrary and I don't think they hold water. I think God's word is pretty simple and pretty clear. There's men's garments. There's women's garments. We shouldn't be putting on the others. If you're a man, don't be wearing a woman's garment. If you're a woman, don't be wearing a man's garment. And you know, if, if you don't believe what I'm saying, then you, need to, you, you still need to consider this verse and figure it out for yourself. What is a man's garment? What is a woman's garment? What is abominable in God's eyes? Figure that out for yourself. But um, I'm convinced, and, and I'm not going to let any culture dictate what's right and wrong. I'm just going to go off of God's word. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your instructions. Pray that you please help us to have the right hearts and minds, attitudes towards your word, and that we would all be willing to, to make the changes necessary. It is to be more in line with, with your word. God, I pray. I pray for myself. I pray that you please help me to become aware of all of, all of the areas where I'm flawed and, um, and that you wouldn't keep those secret from me and help me to be able to, to teach your words um, in the proper spirit and 
that you would um, just help us all to, to be able to, to grow and to become better Christians, to be more conformed under the image of your Son, in whose name we pray.